your Bibles to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, we're going to look at two verses this evening. It's one sentence here. Two verses. The verses are verse 13 and verse 14. Let me just catch you up to speed so that you get back in, in kind of the groove of thought here. Verses 3 through 11 of Ephesians 1 is a listing of all of the blessings that are ours since we are in Christ. Here they are. You can, you can follow along. Verse 3, he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places because we're in Christ. Verse 4, he's chosen to save whosoever will come to him in repentance and faith. Verse 5, he's clothed us in his righteousness so that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Verse 6, he's adopted us into his family as full sons. With all of the associated privileges and all of the associated inheritance. We are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. Verse 7. He's declared us accepted in the beloved. Meaning we're not the outcasts at the family table. We are, we are the guests of honor in the family of God. We're there because... Of all that we have in Christ. Verse 8. He's given us wisdom and insight. To successfully walk through this sin filled world. Verse 9. He's revealed the mysteries. Of himself to us. And then in verses 10 and 11. He has predestined all who are in Christ. To inherit the joys of heaven. So. That's just a, a brief recap. Obviously, an understanding of all of these truths should bring us to, to unending praise. We should just be overflowing with worship as we understand all of these truths. And this evening, we're going to understand and we're going to examine the working of the Holy Spirit and the important part that he plays. And it's probably, unless you've read what we're going to be looking at, and you're familiar with the passage, it's not what you first think when you think of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So let's get right in here in verse 13 as we see the Holy Spirit, who is our seal. He's our seal. Let's look at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. The Holy Spirit has a work in every salvation. The salvations in the Old Testament, the salvations in the New Testament, the salvations in the current day, the salvations that will take place during the tribulation period, the salvations that will take place during the millennium, all of them will be as a result of the working of the Holy Spirit. Because in order to be saved, you have to be convicted of sin, and that's the job of the Holy Spirit. In that way, every salvation testimony is unique, and yet there are elements of them that are still the same. Everyone who is in heaven, regardless of the age that they were saved, regardless of the, the past out of which they were saved, we, we have that unique aspect, but everyone who's standing in heaven will be there by grace, through faith, in the finished work of Jesus Christ. In order to be saved, we heard the truth. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's the gospel that we hear. And then, John 16, verse 8, And when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So you have to hear the gospel. You have to be convicted of your need of the gospel, which is the working of the Holy Spirit in the heart of anyone who's ever been saved. And then you must look to Christ alone for salvation. John 3, 14, as, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then the next verse is John 3, 16, which you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And at the moment that you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the moment that you were born again, the moment you were justified, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. In this verse, he's called the Holy Spirit of promise. 
Romans 8, verse 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Everyone who has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior has the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. That is, that is one of the signs of salvation. We are sealed is the word that's used here. But what does a seal accomplish? Well, there are four main things that a seal accomplishes. Number one, a seal means security. Let me give you a Bible passage. When the religious leaders remembered that Jesus had prophesied his resurrection, right after they took his body down off of the cross, and, and then in the days intervening after the feast, the religious leaders suddenly remembered, oh yeah, he said he was going to rise again on the third day. This is going to be a tremendous headache if something happens. His, his, uh, his disciples are going to come, they're going to steal the body, and uh, it's just going to be a never-ending headache. What we need to do is we need to seal the tomb. Matthew 27, 66, uh, they went to Pilate, they got permission so they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. What they would do is the stone, which uh, the stones in, in, in the movies, we see them and they're, you know, they're these massive things. They, they weren't that big because the doors to the tombs weren't that big. So think maybe like this, about that high. And so they would roll the stone down into a trough that was in front of the door. So once it was there, really hard to move because you had to pick it up to get it out. But they would take wax and they would pour wax over the top of the stone to, to make a seal. And then they would press a, a signet into it. We'll talk about signets in just a moment. And then the, the tomb is sealed. And if, if somebody's going to tamper with it, they'll have to break the seal. And it'll be obvious. You know, the, the, when you open your animal crackers, it says, don't uh, eat if the seal is broken. The, the same idea. A seal provides security. The same was done in the closing of the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6. And the Bible says here that we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We're, we're secure in him. The Holy Spirit is going to, to protect us. The seals of man can be broken. The seal on Jesus' tomb was broken. The seal on the lion's den that Daniel was in was broken. But God's seal can never be broken. It's unbreakable. We are sealed. So, number one, a seal means security. Number two, a seal means authenticity. The government seal attached to a document, what does it do? It verifies this is actual. Uh, this, is, this is the real deal. There are, have you ever watched those infomercials? Uh, and you, you don't get to the clicker fast enough to get it off, right? And, and you, you end up called out in the middle of an infomercial, and they're, they're trying to sell you a real, genuine Chinese replica of whatever it is that they're trying to sell you. But they say, accompanying it comes a certificate of authenticity. And on that, there's usually a, a little a, a two-cent sticker, right, with a piece of ribbon on it. And that's, that's the seal that says this is a genuine whatever it is that you just bought or don't buy. <laughs> Don't buy it, by the way. Uh, it means authenticity. When, when I get a document from the government, when I get a certificate, you can hold it up and it has a, a punch seal sometimes. Sometimes it has a watermark, which is usually a seal as well. Romans 8.14 says, For as many <clears throat> as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So here it is. You're looking at your life, you're looking at the life of someone else, and you say, boy, is there evidence that I, am, that I am genuinely born again? The seal that you look for, what is it? According to this, the seal that you look for, am I led by the Spirit? Is, is so-and-so led by the Spirit? Are they making choices that coincide with one who is led by the Spirit? That's the, the seal of the Holy Spirit. Number three, the purpose of a seal. They, they show ownership. Jeremiah 32 records a real estate transaction that was conducted by the prophet Jeremiah. He bought a piece of land uh, just outside of Jerusalem. Jeremiah 32.10, And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it. And 
took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. If anyone contested the ownership of Jeremiah of this particular piece of land, he could pull out a piece of paper, and on that paper was usually a little puddle of wax. And in that puddle of wax, someone would have pressed their ring or their seal, and they leave their mark. I was there. Bev is a notary. You have a stamp as a notary that says, I saw this paper being signed. I witnessed this paper. And when you affix it, that's, that makes it official. It's the seal. It, it proves ownership. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The, the spirit of God, his seal, shows the ownership. Who owns me? God. Why does he own me? Because he paid for us. He paid for me. How? With the precious blood of his only begotten son, he bought me. I was redeemed, not with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the blood of Jesus Christ. And then number four, the last thing that a seal does, it, it gives authority. A messenger bearing a document sealed by the king operates under the authority of said king. In the story of Esther, after she came into the position of queen, the king also filled another cabinet-level position with a man named Haman. And Haman was a bad guy. He was an Agagite, a descendant of Amalek, and his goal was to destroy the Jews. Haman was given authority to speak in the name of the king of Persia. We read about it in Esther 3.10, which says, And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadath, the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. You say, well, big deal. He gave him a ring. Well, the, the reason that matters is because that was a signet ring. That ring had on it the, the emblem, the etchings that were the, the royal seal. So when Haman wrote a, wrote a proclamation and then they poured the wax on it and he pressed the signet of the king of Persia, he's now operating that, that document, whatever it is, has behind it the full weight and force of the king of Persia. Ahasuerus was his name in that time. Because we're in Christ, talking about the Holy Spirit, because we're in Christ, because we're bearing the seal of the Holy Spirit, you and I are operating under the authority of our king. We operate under the authority of the Most High God. For, or 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled unto God. When, when I stand up and I speak and I say, this is, this is what God says, you should listen. When you stand up and you say, this is what God says, when you share the gospel with your neighbor, you are doing so with authority, the seal of the Holy Spirit. So the, we're, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's his, his first job in, in the life of a believer. He seals us in Christ, showing, uh, again, we, we have security, we have authenticity, we have ownership, and we have authority because we are sealed in him. But this next one is something to get even more excited about. Look at verse 14. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee. Verse 14, which is the earnest, we're talking about the Holy Spirit from verse 13, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Earnest, that, that word, it's the Greek, the, the Greek word means money given as a down payment that the full amount will be subsequently paid means roughly the same thing in English. When we, when we make, give earnest money, if you buy a house, they, they ask for earnest money. Or you could almost say it as a down payment. What does the down payment prove? It proves I'm serious about this, and I'm, I gave you 
this amount of money to prove that I'm, I'm going to return with the rest of the money. I'm giving you a down payment to prove to you that I'm going to come back. The word earnest is used three times in the New Testament, and in each case, it's used in this same context. The Holy Spirit being our earnest, being our down payment. The Holy Spirit is given as a down payment, a, a guarantee of the complete fulfillment of all of God's promises. So, go back with me to verse 3 and just look over it. We already went through verse 3, 4, 5, and on up to verse 11, and then verse 12. We have all of these promises, and they're great, and we're excited about them, and we praise the Lord for them. How can you be sure that God's going to come through? How can you, be, how can you have confidence that God is going to come through? Well, because he's God, and God is true, and every man can be a liar, but God always keeps his word. And God knows that, but God gave us proof. He gave us a guarantee. Hebrews 7.25 promises, it says, Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Are you saved this evening? I hope you are. If you're saved, are you all the way saved or are you just kind of saved? What do you call just kind of saved? Lost, right? You're not just saved is an absolute. You either are saved. So if you're saved this evening, Jesus has died for almost all of your sins, right? No, no almost out. He's died for all of your sins. He's able to save you. To the uttermost. Well, what if it's like the fifth time you've confessed that one? And fifth is being charitable, isn't it? <laughs> what if it's the hundredth time that you've confessed that one? Is, has he had enough? Or is he able to save you to the uttermost? That's pretty awesome, right? He's able to save us all the way. You say, you don't know how bad I am. You don't know how gracious he is. You don't know how powerful the blood of Christ is if you think you can, you can beat it. We, we sing the song, Amazing Grace, and it's true. He saves us to the uttermost. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. I've got a very, very active imagination. I can think crazy things. God can do more. Your, your wildest dreams don't touch what God can do. That's amazing, isn't it? So we've got these promises. We've got our inheritance. Again, in, in the first few verses, verses 3 through 12, we've got all of these things that are promised to us as our inheritance. Many of these blessings... We enjoy in some capacity right now. We talked about this last week. I tried to continually make the point. We have eternal life now. Eternal life doesn't start later. It, it started when you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's part of the inheritance that you get now. We have sonship now. We have access to the throne now. But there are other blessings. Complete eradication of our sin nature. That's going to be great, huh? We sang about that this morning when we said it will be worth it all. We talked about the tempter being banished and laying our burdens down. That, that's coming. Eternal blessings, uh, the, the glorified bodies. Uh, you looking forward to that? You looking forward to pitching your glasses off the side of a cloud somewhere and not having the snap, crap on, pop in your joints anymore and all of the, all of the issues? That's going to be great, and we're promised that. That's in the future, but it's not yet. So we're looking forward to exceeding great and precious promises that are exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think that are to the uttermost. How can we be confident, again, that God's going to give us all of these things? We have some of it now, but how do I know that he's going to give me all of this other stuff? Well, he gave me a down payment. Who is the down payment? 
the third person of the Trinity. God, who lives inside of me, the Holy Spirit, we can have confidence that these things are going to happen. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1.12, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Psalm 103, 14 tells us that God knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust, and so God gave us a guarantee because we're subject to skepticism, aren't we? We, we look at a glorified body and we talk about it. It's going to be great. But you know the old saying, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? And, and there's, a, there's a human element to us that says, man, that sounds great, but is it really going to happen? It's really going to happen. And God proves it because he gives us earnest. He gives us a down payment. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee until the redemption of the purchased possession. That purchased possession there in verse 14. There are different lines of thought as to what exactly the purchased possession is. But I think I can show you from Scripture... I think we can know with some certainty what this is. We already read this, but let me give it to you again. 1 Corinthians 6.19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We've seen in recent weeks, especially in Sunday school, but even in this series, that we're born again and our soul and our spirit are quickened by the Holy Spirit of God. We, we have life in Christ. We have, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, right? We have, we have life. We, we were dead in trespasses and sins, but when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we receive life, but we still have this flesh that Paul talks about in, in Romans 7, 24, and he says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So we still have this flesh. The fact that our body is cursed by sin is evidenced by the fact that our bodies grow old, they start to break down, they suffer, eventually they die and they decay. That's, that's proof that our bodies are subject to sin. Why, why is it that, that we're, we're not continually getting more and more healthy? <laughs> that's, that's just not the way that it works. You, you kind of peak, and then it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it can be rough sometimes, right? Why? Well, because we live in bodies that are cursed by sin. When we die, our bodies are dealt with. Usually they're placed in the ground where they will decay. But that's not a permanent situation. Let me give you some verses. This is, uh, I've been thinking about Fred and his passing and preparing to, to preach his funeral. These verses go very, very well with what I've been thinking and what you know to be true. Job 19.25. By the way, Job, probably the first chronological book in Scripture. <laughs> it, it's the, Job would have lived around the time of, of Abraham. So Job was very likely written even before the books of Moses. So a man who lived thousands of years ago, this is what he said. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. What is Job talking about? He's talking about a resurrection. Job, who is the, the body of Job, is dust. Today, 2024, the body of Job is dust. But one day, in his flesh, Job is going to stand and see God. Which person of God? Jesus Christ. As he stands here upon the earth, Job will see God. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord 
shall not prevent them which are asleep. What is this whole passage talking about? Talking about the rapture, right? When we hear the trumpet. He says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, meaning those who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and then pass away. Their body, their body stopped <laughs> and, and was placed into the ground. Then which, uh, then and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the bodies of, of our loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord, those who died in Christ, when the rapture happens, they actually beat us. The dead in Christ shall rise first. So my grandfather will beat me up into the clouds to be with Christ. But then, very, very quickly, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I too, if I'm still living at the time, will go and, and will ascend into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, another passage about the rapture. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall, be, shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We'll be changed into what? what what's, he, what's he talking about? We shall all be changed. Here it is, Philippians 3.21. Here's, here's what I believe we're talking about when we talk about the purchased possession in Ephesians 1.14. What are we changed into? It says, who shall change our vile body? Do you ever feel like that? You wake up on a Monday morning and you feel around, you say, this vile body, right? And you're being biblical when you do that. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? According to the working whereby he is evil even to subdue all things unto himself. Boy, that's going to be something, isn't it? There's more. This is what we yearn for. Romans 8.23 says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. We yearn for this. There's, there's a part of us that yearns for something that is not here on planet Earth. There's part of us that yearns for heaven, and, and there's part of us that yearns to be fitted for heaven, to receive those glorified bodies. 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What's the purchased possession? He's talking about our bodies. The redemption of the purchased possession. So here it is. I have, I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ when I was four years old. And at that moment, I received a down payment of all the promises of God. And it's the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me today. And if the Lord tarries another, another hundred years and, and I die a natural death and, and my body is placed in the ground. And, and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, so I'm there in the presence of Christ. There is coming a day, like Job said, that Jesus is going to stand on earth, and in my flesh, I'll see God. And in your flesh, if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, you too will see God, because one day, that our body will be redeemed. When we stand at the grave of a loved one who died in Christ, and we say something to the effect of rest in peace, it's not an eternal wish, because they're not going to rest eternally in peace in that grave. One day, they're coming out of it. Why? Because faithful is he that promised, who also will do it, who's able to do it exceeding abundantly, who saves us to the uttermost. One day, their body is going to be resurrected. Because why? Why does God care about the body? Why does God, this flesh... Why does God care about it? Because he bought it. Because he bought it with what? The blood of his only begotten son, and it's precious to him. 
then one day, he's going to call it out. And he's going to, he'll have me body, soul, and spirit, all glorified, all made just like Christ. What should we do with all of this truth? The last phrase of verse 14. <clears throat> all of these things are unto the praise of his glory. Praise God for his promises. Praise God for everything that's ours in Christ. Praise God for the sealing office of the Holy Spirit, which gives us security, authenticity. It proves ownership and it confers authority. Praise God for that. Praise God for giving us the guarantee of future blessing. By giving us the earnest, the down payment of the Holy Spirit. Now, how can I know that God is going to keep all of these, pr these promises to me in the future? Because he gave me the Holy Spirit as the down payment that says, I'm going to, I'm going to do it all. And I prove it. Praise God that this flesh is not all there is. There's the our flesh, if we've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, is the purchased possession. And he will redeem it. He paid for it. And one day, he'll have it. 2 Corinthians 5.1, and I close with this. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, that's what's addressing you right now. If this earthly house, this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. And house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desire to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. As children of God, we do, we, we yearn for when we will have our glorified bodies, when we'll be able to look into the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be something. It's going to be, it's going to be wonderful, and it's all ours because he promised. And because God keeps his promises, and he even gives us proof. He gives us a down payment, an earnest of the promises that he's made. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all of these blessings that are ours in Christ. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't get over these things. I pray that we would keep them in the forefront of our mind and that when we have downtime that we would just glory in all that you've given to us. Lord, we thank you that this body, this life, however long you bless us with, here on earth, Lord, we thank you that this isn't it. We thank you that there's greater life, there's new life, there's abundant life in you. And Lord, we thank you for that. I pray that you would uh, just minister these truths to our hearts. Comfort us, Lord, with these truths, especially as we think of lost loved ones, and as, as from time to time loved ones pass on, I pray that we would remember these truths and that we would rest in you. I pray now that you'd bless our time of fellowship. I pray that you'd bless the food to our bodies, bless our fellowship to your honor and glory. Lord, we thank you for all that's ours in Christ. In his name.